Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. A huge amount of employment in East Africa exists in the informal sector. People often working on an ad hoc basis with little record of what they do. This means that it is difficult for workers to build a reputation and for customers to generate trust. Adam and Johannes at Link see a great opportunity to use technology to bring value to this broad sector. We talk about the founding story of their services marketplace and how it began above a hardware store, the processes around matching customers and workers, and their vision for how data can bring benefits to the whole sector. It's a super interesting episode, and I hope you enjoy. Cool. So I'm here today with Johannes and Adam from Link in the Link house, really, you'd call it. Um, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks. Really glad to be here. Thank you. Cool. So uh, just to get started, could you tell us a bit about Link and how you kind of got in the position of, of doing the company? All right. So, <laughs> uh, Link is specifically focused on the relationship that exists between informal workers and you know households or businesses or those that that would otherwise employ them. So maybe for those that don't know, uh, about eighty percent of the working population in Kenya works in the informal sector, right? So these are individuals that uh, you know aren't getting a pay slip, <laughs> uh, don't have social or governmental protections around the work that they do, and uh, we felt that there's a huge amount of value that that we could uh, try to add to, to this sector with technology. So um, we began with the the question of what does LinkedIn look like for the linked out, right? What does it look like for a carpenter or a plumber or a tailor? And with that, uh, we, we, we tried to create uh, a platform that, that worker identity and, and career progress or progression or accomplishments could be featured on. Uh, and then finally, uh, we realized that this provided a lot of value for customers that then maybe wanted to find skilled professionals for specific tasks that they had. So um, for those maybe outside of Kenya, they, they might liken it to you know some kind of um, service marketplace. So in the US, some of those are like TaskRabbit or Thumbtack. And um, you know, in the UK, there's like Bisbee and other things like that. And, uh, and so how long have you been working on it? About a year. So um, yeah. All right, and uh, and how many um, two transactions or like actually how many done? How does the business work? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, it, it began with a lot of conversations with. with I, I think an important word for this conversation is fundi. So that that's what like maybe a general worker is called a, a blue collar worker. So if someone was like a mason or a plumber or a carpenter, they'd be called a fundi, right? Um, and that's someone that that's actually skilled in that trade, right? There, there's like fundis and fundi helpers. So we began by speaking to a lot of fundis. So we we used to live in an apartment above a hardware store, and we would spend our days talking to fundis and our nights developing oh, yeah. And, yeah, and other stuff. So uh, now we have about 700 fully verified, interviewed, profiled workers in our system. Uh, we have about four or 500 inactive. That means that we've either deactivated them or, or have not yet activated them for whatever reason. Um, We've done close to 2,000 jobs. So a, a job would, would be the, the yeah, a, a service being carried out or a product being made through our platform. Um, and we're growing each month. Yeah, we do about 10 jobs a day. Yeah, and we have about 150 different categories. So, you know, you, you just got to see some, uh, uh, hopefully they look nice, but like some, some serving boards that we were making for a restaurant. Uh, meanwhile, we're helping um, a, a person get their house clean, helping someone make uh, a, a, a chaise lounge. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, we're, we're doing electrical wiring. We're doing. We're helping people find cooks, etc. So we have about 150 categories of professionals at the moment. Okay, so you, you've decided quite early on to go quite broad, rather than saying we're going to like nail the carpentry. Uh, why did you choose to do that? I think the market isn't really big enough in just one of these categories. So, I mean, how many plumbing requests are there in Nairobi really, you know, like some companies choose to do that. Uh, the complexity is certainly lower if you do that, right? So you, you're able to focus your product on exactly that kind of request. 
you're able to build your workforce on that kind of, of, of speciality. So it makes it, it makes it a lot easier. We chose to do the harder, do it the harder way. Um, because we, we think, first of all, the market isn't big enough in one of these categories. And second of all, um, I, I think the real value of a horizontal marketplace is that you can come to us for almost every, anything. Uh, and a big problem in this market is it is just really hard to find the right people for something that you're looking for. Right. So obviously, like if, if you, if you're a cleaning marketplace, people will hopefully learn over time that they come to your cleaning marketplace for cleaning, but it doesn't really solve the underlying issue of a lack of information in the market. So that's what we really want to solve. And, uh, and so. What are the who, who are the clients then, and um, and are they just getting you for one service, or are they getting sort of many many jobs? We've been doing jobs for under a year, so maybe for eight months or so. Our average number of jobs per customer is now about seven. Um, so, so customers are coming back. We we don't do any um, marketing, so maybe most people will not have heard of us uh, because. Um, we're, we're pretty focused now on on building up the, the processes in place. You know, I think. As Johanna said, we, we maybe are, are a little bit masochistic, but making a, a horizontal service marketplace is hard because you need processes, especially the horizontal service marketplace where you're not just lead gen. So an example of just lead gen would be like Craigslist has a lot of services, right? But like Craigslist doesn't know anything about how that plumber did, right? They don't in any way get involved in the payment and we're involved all the way through, right? To make sure that someone has a great experience. Um, so there's a lot of processes that, that need to be made in order to make sure that things go well, that, that customers and workers both are protected, uh, that the learnings that we get from any of these jobs are, are, are codified into, into company growth. Um, so we're, we're fortunate in that the initial customers that we tested with liked the service a lot and told other individuals about it. And, and we're growing strongly <laughs> organically, um, but, but we're still not at the stage yet where we want to shout about it from the mountaintops, um, but that will be coming soon. Um, yeah. So what, what's the typical profile of one of your customers? We have, it, it's mainly home, home or apartment owners, obviously. So most of our job requests are for things in someone's house, right? I need this painted or I need this, uh, whatever. We have pretty even demographic split between male and female requests. And then, uh, I'd say about a, a third uh, of our customer requests come from, uh, like Kenyan Indians, a third come from, uh, Kenyans, and then maybe a third come from expats. But nephew, many of our early adopters were our friends. Yeah. Which you know, explains the higher percentage of expats. Probably. Yeah, and I mean, also, it, it's it's definitely like middle class and above. So maybe it's, it's those individuals that like, uh, you know, want this leak fixed immediately and, and don't want to do it themselves and, and maybe want it in, in a very reliable way, right? So uh, the decision isn't. I, I think that our, our prices are incredibly competitive and often much less than most people would be paying outside of the system. But um, I think maybe that that's like the biggest fear that that would scare someone off in the first place. So it's someone that, that is willing to pay a bit more for, for quality, for knowing that the person that comes to fix this refrigerator, is, it's going to be fixed instead of you know breaking down again. In two weeks. Is it more sort of, um, I don't want to say reactive, but... Um, I've got a problem, I need it fixed, rather than I'm planning to have a new table I'd like someone who's good. Uh, most of our most of our requests are reactive, right? So so certainly all of them are pull. So by that I mean the customer has to come to us and say, "I want this service." Um, you know, Johannes is is a really talented data scientist. So um, not to speak too much for him, but like you know, he's really excited about the incredible data that that we're collecting every day with each job we do. But you know, for every worker that does a job, we know hey, this person is really awesome at making this type of table or this person is really awesome at dealing with with, with problems with uh, PPR plumbing pipes, right? Um, and, and that unlocks uh, future opportunities of push content, right? This masseuse does, uh, you know, like Indonesian head massage really, really well. And you don't even know that you could get that. But, you know, for, you know, a thousand shillings for an hour, right? Like um, that's a pretty cool service that, that you didn't know about. And you know that this person is, is verified and safe and, and has 20 people vouching for them in the form of, of customer reviews. So um, we're, we're excited to do that. But yeah, now most of it is like my toilet shooting water in the air. <laughs> and, uh, and so for these is fundies, so where were they typically getting their work from before? Almost exclusively word of mouth or, I mean, if you spend, <laughs> if you're driving around town, you'll see like a lot of <laughs> Tape to um, telephone poles and things like that, you know, like plumber, 
with a phone number or a lot of companies will hang around hardware stores, right? I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Because if you're like going to a hardware store to buy stuff, then maybe you need someone to, to help with installing it. So we thought maybe this would be a, a better way. And this maybe showcases how much you know, like, there are problems in this market. So these, you know, plumbers are maybe sitting in front of the hardware shop for two days before they receive a job. And then maybe they have, I don't know, several jobs that day and can only fulfill one. And then they're sitting for another three days idle. So obviously that time isn't utilized in a good way. Yeah, and again, even if that person does an awesome job, you know, the best they could hope for is maybe that that person requests them again, or maybe gives their, their number to someone. But yeah. you know, I'm not gonna ask. So you used to live above the hardware shop. Mm -hmm. Did, which came first, the idea for Link or <laughs> living, <laughs> <in the> yeah, <laughs> living in the hardware shop actually? So okay. uh, yeah, it was a, a, a lower income area in Nairobi, uh, but a really beautiful place, and. Um, yeah, and and so I I guess the idea for Link did, did come before it. So uh, I I used to work at Google, so I was still working at Google at the time, um, and I was really interested in in the informal sector and in doing something with it. Johannes and I were speaking about it. He was finishing up his his uh, master's degree, um, and so I was like, this is a pretty perfect space because it's close to what I want to do next. Okay, okay. and then and then you found. An, ap an apartment that was above a hardware shop and yeah. you got a chance to speak to everyone. And then, and then, but like Link only started a few months after. So, so I found the place, waited for Johannes to get out here. Uh, I wanted to initially do something about financial inclusion. And when I came here, I just realized that this is such a problem this month. See. So I, I didn't want to decide for us what we would be working on. So the plan was that Johannes would come out here, spend three months looking around Nairobi while I finished up and transitioned out of Google. Uh, and yeah, it didn't really work like that. No, nope. <laughs> I started coding on like day three or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you guys meet? Nine years ago oh. in Israel. So we studied together. Oh, okay. yeah. Nice. And uh, and just so Google had an office in Nairobi, or did you have an office in Nairobi? Um, what would it what did it feel like to what what did it feel like to step up Google and um, and start your own thing? Well. I definitely lost weight. <laughs> no. no, it was great. I, I've been meaning to do it for a while. So I, I had worked at Google for five years in, in the US and in Kenya. Um, and it's a great company, um, as, as I'm sure many people know. Uh, but I think a, a lot of people at, at, at Google want to solve really, really big problems um, that they care a lot about. And, and Google is a really great place to do that. And, and that was why I convinced Google to let me come out to Kenya because I, I wanted to solve uh, I guess different sorts of problems than we were solving in San Francisco, uh, and and actually the project I was working on at Google um, got picked up by the San Francisco office and, and asked everyone to move back to San Francisco. Uh, so I used that as a good transition point. But I mean, just being here, uh, I, I in my time at Google got to spend a lot of time with the informal economy here in Kenya, um, and and yeah, ever since I started, I was tinkering around with like employment, what can we do in order to help match people to jobs? At first, I was looking at like day laborers for factories and farms and stuff like that. Um, and then um, we, we kind of expanded it further. So it felt good and scary and um, exciting and, and yeah, freeing all, all, all at once. Um, and it still feels like that every day. So I guess we're enjoying it and doing something right. <laughs> um, what have been the biggest surprises or the biggest learnings you've had since starting Link? <laughs> um, I have no clear thoughts about this. So there's many, many, many small things that we learn every single day. Um, I, I guess so we, we're solving a really hard problem, right? So there, there, there is, there are some. Um, uh, how can I say this without being too mean? To people from the informal sector. So there's are some inherent behaviors that are really, really hard to change, and we want to change some of them, and that is a big challenge. So yeah. uh, the, the easiest example is, I guess, timeliness, right? So uh, especially people from the informal sector, especially fundies who, you know, like day laborers and so on, they don't care so much about time, and they don't really know that customers might do that, right? So, so a customer might actually take the day free in order to, you know, like show the plumber what he's supposed to do, and uh, you know, be there for him and so on. And then that plumber doesn't come today because he chooses that maybe tomorrow is a better time. So these sorts of behaviors is something that we're changing and that it's really, really hard. 
and we're obviously doing this in a nice way, right? So we're using carrots and sticks, not only sticks. <laughs> but uh, that that is a big challenge. And um, well, I, I we guess... also we we want people to understand, right? So I think we, we wanted to be very cognizant of of behavior that exists in this market. So yeah. for example, um, some people might say, you know, maybe you can offer all of your products and services on an hourly rate, right? If, if you're going to hire a plumber from Link, you know, it's whatever, 500 shillings an hour. But if you were to ask most fundis, uh what their hourly rate is, most would say that they don't like to work like that, right? Um, so that they like to work on a task basis or maybe on a day rate in some cases. But I, I guess the point being, there, there are a lot of realities within this market that were important for us to understand and learn. And, you know, there were those that we said we should change this behavior and those that we said we, we should adapt maybe adapt <laughs> and, and respect this behavior. Um, so our our pricing has a lot of autonomy for the workers. Uh, the way that, that uh, we make money, right, that does not come from the workers. Uh, but, you know, we say <laughs> whether or not being on time is important to, to you as, 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 a, as a link professional, it is really important to our platform and, and, and to our customers. So that's something that we said, you know, and there are plenty of individuals that, 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 that do keep time well. Um, but, you know, we, we said there are certain things that, that, that we want people to adhere to. So, for example, like being honest about a, a person's capability. So I think a really common reality that exists in this market is this whole concept of like, I'll try my level best. So if you have someone that like comes and works on your toilet and then you're like, Hey, do you know anyone that can like fix a refrigerator? Then maybe they'll be like, I can do it. I'll do it. And you'll be like, really? And they're like, yes. <laughs> I'll try my level best. Really, right? Yeah, because if someone you know would have to wait another three days to find a job, um, and here's this one in front of them, and there's there's no like better business bureau or uh, certification board for for you as as a as a vocational worker that could take your license away or something like that, right? There isn't a huge consequence that exists. So um, there are good and bad things about about the kind of like try your best effort, but it can lead to a lot of frustrations in like a big job, right? If, if you want to spend a lot of money to get like a very nicely made bespoke bed um, and someone had a good experience with a carpenter that helped hang stuff on the wall for them and then says, hey, you should call my my, my, my carpenter, John. Uh, you know, m maybe that that's not going to be the best experience. So getting back to that whole, like, what does the LinkedIn for the linked out look like? Um, we're collecting this sort of information about the sub skills that individuals are, are good at and the areas where they can improve, um, which we hope unlocks a lot of opportunities around upskilling uh, and, 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 and like further certification. Awesome. Um, I just noted that in the background, said, is that your company dog? This no, the, those are the guard dogs. Oh, it's the guard dog back door. Yeah. We do have two company dogs. You don't have okay. so now, like, they're very small. <laughs> um, so when I'm a client, am I, am I, do I feel like I'm getting a link? Carpenter, or do I feel like I'm getting John the Carpenter who, who, who I found through Link? Um, so ideally, I initially make a request to Link, right? So what we do next is um, first understand your request. So we'll ask you a couple of questions in an automatic way to understand exactly what your request is, um, and then we we really are a little bit of a search company. So we match that request to profiles of carpenters, and we ask those carpenters in some kind of a reverse auction to give us a quote, a detailed quote, where they list out materials, labor prices, and so on, and we show these to you. So that way you as a customer see the profiles of these guys. You see the past jobs that they have done. You see the prices. Um, you can learn a little bit about, about them. So we show you their bio, their certifications, a picture of them so you know how they look, pictures of stuff that they have done in the past, and that way you can get a good feeling for them, and then you can choose who to work with. So you're both hiring Link and John the Carpenter. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going, it's not like I'm going on and I'm just scrolling through all the carpenters and saying, I want John. You're doing some, um, right now we can do that. Uh, and, and I'll probably not ever, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are several issues with that. Um, I guess an easy one to understand is scheduling because if you just go through profiles, you don't know if that guy is going to be free on Saturday when you need him. Yeah. What we like to do is, is yeah, we, we, we retain these profiles. But, but again, you know, the, the profiles are at public links. So for example, a worker could share their profile with, with an individual in the future, but, we think a customer scrolling through tons of profiles is not necessarily the best experience. Uh, we're what we would what you would call like a full service solution. So whereas something like like an Angie's list uh, might say, here's a whole bunch of plumbers, just choose the one that you want to work with, and you can see where they're located and and maybe um, like the reviews that they have, right? Just like maybe Yelp would have for restaurants. But um, in this case. One of the biggest challenges that might exist between a consumer and a fundi is 
is appropriately understanding the scope of work, right? So maybe the customer is frustrated that, that the job like didn't deliver what they expected it to. Maybe the, the fundi feels like, like the customer asked for the scope to change throughout uh, and, and they're, you know, spending more time or money uh, or, or committing more material than they thought they would. And, and we found that we can alleviate a lot of that tension um, but by staying involved. So for example, understanding the scope of the job, if someone says, you know, I want a masseuse, uh, and, and just looks through a ton of massage profiles, it's not necessarily the best experience because, yeah, the one that you might find maybe isn't available at the time that you want, lives very far from you, doesn't have the massage bed that you're looking for. But a, a better experience is if, so far we think, if you go through a, a flow, that's maybe a sticks question that asks, where are you located? Uh, how, how long would you like the massage to occur for? What variation of massage would you like? Is it shiatsu or Swedish or holistic? Uh, do you have a preference on the gender of masseuse? Do you want them to carry massage bed? Do you have a specific focus area of the body, right? What we can then do is, in an automatic way, filter through our 50 verified masseuses in order to say, you know, these 10 are the best suited, send the request to them first, and then each of them can review whether they're available at that time, that they want to travel to that location, maybe how much the cost of their transportation would be, and then provide a quote. So what you're then seeing is the exact best suited professionals for that job and their quoted price. So you don't even need to get into the issue of negotiating with them, having a conversation, calling them, maybe they're not home, et cetera. And I guess also importantly, uh, our professionals understand that they're quoting against each other, mm. which will probably bring the price to a, a fair level. Whereas if you speak to one person and you know, maybe you're white skinned, so uh, <laughs> it might be more expensive otherwise. And um, how does the payment happen? So uh, payment flows through our system. So uh, we found that one area of friction is you know, for, for most workers, they they would be paid in cash and, and when or how or at what intervals there's payment, um, what, what's a bit difficult. Customers are have been burned in a lot of cases, giving down payments for materials to workers that then disappear, et cetera. So, so money flows through us. Um, for smaller jobs, payment occurs uh, after the job has completed, actually. So in our massage example, um, the customer would pay us after that job has completed. Uh, we, we pay the worker as well after the job is completed. We pay workers automatically through mobile money and uh, we collect payments from customers by their preferred payment method, whether it's um, credit card or M-Pesa or PayPal or bank transfer or whatever. What's the, um, so, so you make your money on the commission between the two? We add a 10% commission to the job value. So that yeah, is <laughs> enough to cover our, like the, the, the money transfer costs and um, yeah, again, we, we, we kind of totally securitize the, the, the job. So yeah. if uh, any money is, so, so we've actually been fortunate enough that in, in the 2000 or so jobs we've done, never had a worker steal money, I guess. Um, and and we, we did a bit of market research before this happened. And it seemed like in 30% of cases where a customer gave a down payment to a worker, that money disappeared. Uh, so that's like a huge value, right? And that we hope that we can avoid right there. And I think it's because, um, Maybe if you look for a plumber, you might need that plumber one time in a year or maybe even just one time total, right? So uh, if they can't quite find the material that they were looking for or, you know, are, are feeling nefarious, then um, there isn't a lot of a lot to deter them maybe from, from, from doing something bad. But in our case, you know, if we represent 15 jobs to that plumber in a month, uh, it, it deters that behavior a lot. Also, we do a, a pretty heavy check on the workers that enter our system and, and have a lot of information about that. Um, yeah, so we, we, we found that, yeah, we have about a 4.8 out of five star customer satisfaction rating of our job. So most people are happy. And then, uh, we have 24 seven customer service. So, um, yeah, if, if for any reason something isn't happening well, we luckily have uh, a deep enough network that we'll be very happy to send someone else to fix that problem. Or, um, now we've maybe done enough jobs in, in most of the main categories to, to know what has gone wrong and, and how to fix it or solve it or prevent it. Now, in terms of the, the communication, is it that uh, I've now got John McCarpenter's number and I'll just communicate with him? Or is it, does it go, go through some sort of platform whereby you can see as well? Like, well how did, how do, how did it? Carpentry is an interesting question, actually, because um, carpentry projects right now we manage quite manually. Um, so we will give you John the Carpenter's number as soon as you have confirmed the quote and, and, and booked him, essentially. So at that point, you can communicate with him. For carpentry projects, we stay heavily involved just because they are very complex normally, uh, and we want to learn as much as we can from them. So we're still, you know, like very low scale, uh, and we are still able to do this. And we do this in order to learn for our own operations. 
how to how to set it up properly and so on. Uh, for most jobs, it's not really necessary for us to stay. So, so think of a cleaner, for example. If you want to call her to tell her where you're, you're located and so on, you, you can. So most, most of the workers in our system are, are probably making less than ten dollars a day and, and do not. So about thirty percent of them have um, like relatively uh, m modern version smartphones. Uh, of them, not necessarily all of them use apps or, or want to be connected to the internet all the time, which mandates that uh, we need to communicate with our workers primarily through SMS, right? Which locks some of the opportunities that there might be to, for example, have an in-app chat platform where a customer has an app and a worker has an app and they chat through, through our platform. Uh, th these are things that, that we're, of course, very excited to build. It just doesn't make sense for, for, for this target market right now. Um, so, so we communicate with customers through a, you know, web or, or, or an app, um, or if they prefer to call or, or, or email us, that's fine as well. And we communicate with workers primarily through SMS. Um, for, for many jobs, uh, yeah, we, we will give the phone number. Uh, maybe the, the question you were kind of asking is, what is, what is to stop uh, them from cutting us out of that transaction? Um, so we, we have several thoughts on, on being cut out, I guess, we we so far seen in, in the past year us being cut in more often than being cut out actually. So uh, be, being cut out is is kind of inevitable in any kind of service marketplace. It's just making sure it's at a manageable level. So and and for anyone thinking about making a, a service marketplace, I think that that's always the the right answer to the question, right? You can never totally avoid it, right? Maybe people uh, cut Uber out of out, out of these sorts of transactions, but the way to address it is to make sure that you're adding as much value. To, to both sides as possible, and that you don't have too many disincentives for participating in the platform. So in our case, workers aren't charged anything to be part of our platform, right? So they actually have no incentive to cut us out, and they have a number of of, of value, uh, like opportunities that, that they achieve through our platform. They get uh, consistent feedback into our profile. They get uh, you know material deposits that they need. They get paid on time. Uh, they, they get support from us if they're running into any problems with the job or if the customer is being difficult. Uh, and of course, they know that, you know, the, the, the good work that they do and the comments that they get can then be leveraged into more jobs in the future, right? So, so many customers would want to stay or many workers would want to stay involved. In the customer's case, um, so far, and we, we did a lot of testing on this as well. Most people felt that that 10% but was a pretty small price to pay in order to uh, kind of have us handle all the logistics, get the person there on time, help them find their house, uh, manage the timelines of a project, uh, send any kind of replacement, guarantee the work, have a warranty that, that we're helping to uphold, and a number of other things. So uh, that, that's how we're avoiding being cut out right now. But, but we, we don't really have many like sticks in place, so we're not really punishing anyone, but we've been lucky enough to see that. Um, customers uh, appreciate the, the, the service enough to um, usually want to keep us involved. I guess another thing, uh, we're a horizontal marketplace, meaning we have many, many, many different uh, categories of services. So if someone got like a cook from us that they really liked, um, and then they decided, you know what, I don't need to continue booking this cook through Link, um, still they would probably have derived a lot of value from the service that we provide of identifying and connecting them to a really hot, like high quality professional. So it's probably still likely that they would come back to us if they needed a plumber or an electrician, et cetera. So now we have about 150 categories. So even if the customer cut us out of each one, um, they could still go horizontal and, and that's pretty good lifetime value for the customer. So, um, yeah, so you're doing a lot of value for this 10%. Um, I mean, is it a sustainably, like, is it a sustainable video? Are you going to be profitable one day? <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we need a lot of scale in order to be profitable. Um, I guess what we think is valuable is is that we get a lot of usage, uh, we get a lot of users, and, and we provide a really excellent, enjoyable service for a fair price. Uh, we we think that this is a business where there's a lot of really amazing things that you can do with the data that we collect. For example, uh, every job that we do is a, a potential service that we could push or offer in the future. So every table that we make, right, that, that, that we can get a nice, beautiful picture for can go into some kind of uh, online store of, of where a person could find a table, right? Every um, uh, great, awesome skill that, that one of the workers has um, can can then be curated into push content. We talked about how all of our 
our content now is pull content, but can be curated to push content in the future. Another really great example is, you know, when we spend almost an hour getting to know workers that enter our system, when uh, we interact with them with each job that they do, and we know how much money they're earning with each job, how many jobs they're doing a month, and how reliable or dependable they are in the form of customer feedback, this is probably very valuable information for a, a bank or a credit institution that would otherwise not have a lot of access to, you know, a sector that is largely unbanked <laughs> or, or, or doesn't have uh, a, a, a traditional documentation around employment that, that, that you know, loans would require. Um, it's probably a lot of, we're collecting, you know, we collect information from all the materials that we use, right? So there's a, a lot of value that, that we can unlock in terms of bulk purchasing of materials, et cetera. So um, our, our plan now is, uh, yeah, provide a lot of value um, uh, for, for a fair price. And actually, our, our unit economics are, are such that the, the 10% actually does cover all of our, our cost of sales. Um, and, and if we achieve scale, um, it unlocks profitability. <laughs> cool. So uh, we'll just do, uh, do a few more questions. Um, so if we were to sort of fast forward three years, what would Link look like? Would it just be here? What, you know, what, what did the company look like? So Adam sometimes talks about his vision and that he says uh, from the worker side, maybe a fundi wakes up in the morning, opens their link up, checks through open jobs, gives a few quotes here and there, um, maybe watches an educational video about his profession because you know by then we have learned that there's an interesting skill to be learned in solar panel installation, which there's a lot of market demand for, but not enough professionals who know it, and then we can push content for that. Um, I don't know, like they update their profile. They update their profile. They get connected to other fundies. Yeah. Maybe they get request a loan because hey, they just want a really big job, making a bed for for forty thousand shillings, but they they need twenty thousand down payment, or they need twenty thousand shillings of materials so that they can get started. Um, and you know that that's a pretty almost securitized loan, right? When you know that they have a job for this, that the demand is there. I mean, it's uh, I think. There, there's some interesting things, but in terms of the company in three years, maybe we're in one or two more countries. So going towards regional expansion. Um, obviously, we have grown the team a lot. The, yeah. So the, the, they say the home services industry in the United States is 800 billion dollars, maybe more now. I, I think it's a bit more. And so there's a lot of players, and they're still like at only a fraction of that market, right? So I think the home services market. It's going to grow a lot in Kenya. And, and I think the challenges that we're trying to learn how to solve in Kenya are, are similar in a lot of other um, sub-Saharan African countries, right? Um, that there, there's a lot of individuals that have vocational skills or, or that are receiving vocational training that, that don't receive the kind of like matching part that, that comes after that training. So there's a lot of vocational training programs that, that go on here in Kenya. But, you know, just like an individual would go to university and then they have a career center at their university that helps them take the next step or has LinkedIn to, to create their, their career profile or something like that, that the training isn't necessarily enough. So I, I think that there's a number of other countries where where Link or, or, or Link, you know, plus or minus some, some things could, could make a lot of sense in. But uh, what I'm really excited about is uh, unlocking something that, that adds a lot of value uh, to customers and, and to the people that that, that they might want to contract for, for services or products. And I think if we can find a, a slew of very useful technology solutions for them, there will be opportunities to apply that anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and how can people listening at home follow the story of Link? Well, <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook, Link Kenya, uh, or on Twitter. It's, it's, it's a link, link with a Y. That's right. Y, y so L Y N K. Um, or you can visit our website, which is www.lynk.co.ke. And uh, you can test uh, the, the, the public version of our request flow, which is uh, a little bit uh, standard. So it's just an, an open-ended request. That, that's what we used in the first months in order to test out what sorts of services do people want. Um, but also on that, uh, on that website, you have the opportunity to request to test out our app. And then you can start getting into some of the really fun stuff about um, how we start understanding the scope of the job and asking questions. Cool. Well, Adam, Johannes, thanks so much. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. 
You can see the show notes for this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. This show is still relatively new, and so I really appreciate you making it through to the end. What would be great is, if you're enjoying it, to tell a couple of your friends about it too, in case they'd also be interested in giving it a listen. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com, and I'd be happy to chat. In any case, have a great week, and speak to you soon.